Good morning. Even though we could be meeting today, as it is lawful for us to do so, we have decided to wait two more weeks to help ensure the safety of our congregation. On June the 7th, we will hold our first regular service since March. We would like to thank each and every member of the Sharondale Church of Christ for their faith and dedication to the church. Many have been very faithful in picking up your communion and giving your tithes and offerings. Many have also expressed concern about the financial status of the church. God has blessed us with generous and giving members, and the church has been able to maintain through this trying time. I'd like to read from Psalm 96. Sing to the Lord a new song. Sing to the Lord all the earth. Sing to the Lord. Praise his name. Proclaim his salvation day after day. Declare his glory among the nations, his marvelous deeds among all peoples. For great is the Lord, and most worthy of praise. He is to be feared above all gods. For all the gods of the nations are idols, but the Lord made the heavens. Splendor and majesty are before him. Strength and glory are in his sanctuary. Ascribe to the Lord, all you families of nations. Ascribe to the Lord glory and strength. Ascribe to the Lord the glory due his name. Bring an offering and come unto his courts. Worship the Lord in the splendor of his holiness. Tremble before him all the earth. Say among, among the nations, the Lord reigns. The world is firmly established. It cannot be moved. He will judge the peoples with equity. Let the heavens rejoice, let the earth be glad, let the sea resound and all that is in it. Let the fields be jubilant and everything in them. Let all the trees of the forest sing for joy. Let all nations rejoice, believe the Lord for he comes. He comes to judge the earth. He will judge the world in righteousness and the peoples in his faithfulness. Let us pray. Dear God, our Heavenly Father, how thankful, Father, that we are to have the technology to be able to come into people's homes and bring the service to them that are unable to uh, be out at this time. And God, we pray for each and every one of our members that they continue in the faith, be strong, to know that you are God and you're in control of it all. And Father, we're glad that you are in control of it because we do not see what you see. God, we're thankful for all the blessings of life that you give us each and every day. You see to our needs. You know what we need even before we ask. And God, we know that if we ask of anything in Jesus' name, that it will be done. And God, we're so thankful for your word and how it instructs us, how it encourages us. Thankful for each and every member of the church, Father, and how much they love the church and care for the church and how much you love and care for each and every one of them. God, we pray that uh, as things begin to open back up, that uh, you'd watch over and protect your people. And know, Father, that we're doing the best that we can under the circumstances to stay as one to be one in the faith, one in heart, and to know, Father, that, that you are our Father. 
God, we thank you so much for everything that you do for us, but we thank you most of all for your Son and our Savior, Jesus Christ. It's in his name that we pray. Amen. psalm for giving grateful praise. Shout for joy to the Lord, all the earth. Worship the Lord with gladness. Come before him with joyful songs. Know that the Lord is God. It is he who made us, and we are his. We are his people, the sheep of his pasture. Enter his gates with thanksgiving and his courts with praise. Give thanks to him and praise his name. For the Lord is good 
and his love endures forever. His faithfulness continues through all generations. Luke 1, verses 46 through 55. And Mary said, My soul glorifies the Lord, and my spirit rejoices in God my Savior, for he has been mindful of the humble state of his servant. From now on all generations will call me blessed, for the mighty one has done great things for me. Holy is his name. His mercy extends to those who fear him from generation to generation. He has performed mighty deeds with his hand. He has scattered those who are, pro who are proud in their inmost thoughts. He has brought down rulers from their thrones, but he has lifted up the humble. He has filled the hungry with good things, but he has set the rich away empty. He has helped his servant Israel, remembering to be merciful to Abraham and his descendants forever, just as he has promised his ancestors. This is the prayer of Mary in Luke 1, 46-55, in her response to greeting Elizabeth. This prayer is also known as the, as the Magnificat, Latin for, My soul glorifies the Lord. As Mary magnifies the Lord, she names things he does for his people. God always remembers. He remembered his covenant with Abraham, to bless all the nations through his descendants. He remembers Israel when they cried out to him from Egypt. He remembered his promise to David that he would always have a son on the throne. He remembered the hope he gave to the Israel throughout all of his prophets. His covenant, the redemption of Israel, the them escaping from Egypt, the promises to David, and the hope for Israel through the prophets all point to one thing, the coming of the Messiah, Jesus Christ. God's promises are always steadfast. He always remembers them and he keeps them. Just before Jesus died, he told us to remember him at the table, in his body and in his blood. God faithfully remembers his promises. Do we remember the promises that we make to him? Or has this table become meaningless or just a regular ritual? Does the bread being his body mean anything to us? Do we remember that we are truly his body? Do we see meaning in the covenant blood? Do we remember that we have a covenant with God today? That his blood was given to sanctify us and to make us, us his people? Let us faithfully remember him in the bread and the cup, and he always remembers us. I pray we never take this table for granted. Memorial Day, is a nation, it, Memorial Day in our nation comes once a year. This is Memorial Day weekend. All of us have different thoughts and memories, remembering fallen war heroes, special friends, events, family members. You have your own list of special memories. Typically, cemeteries are decorated. Some places have special parades or ceremonies. Jesus gave us his church at Memorial Day. It's not annual, but it is weekly. The early church gathered each week to remember Jesus' death by breaking the bread and sharing the cup of blessing and remembrance, and we continue that today. In our nation, Memorial Day is a time when we feel closer to those who share the same experiences as we do. So also, in this communion service at church, we not only connect with God to be reminded of the salvation he provides in, his, in Christ's blood, but we also connect with others who share the memory, the blessings, and the same salvation. Let us pray for communion. Heavenly Father, thank you again for this opportunity that we can gather around this table each Lord's Day. Even though we are physically not with one another, we are together in spirit and truth. Lord, I pray that you'll continue to forgive us for where we've sinned and fallen short. Lord, I also pray that you always um, just help us remember you in everything that we say and we do, and that we always put your son first. And Lord, I always pray that we remember the reason, the purpose of this communion. It is just a piece of bread. It is just a piece of juice to the person who doesn't believe or to those who are not Christians. But to us, this is a holy communion. This is our time where we can physically be in contact with you each Lord's Day. 
Lord, I pray that you bless this bread. Lord, I pray that we always remember it was your son's body that was beaten and tortured. The crown was pushed down on his head. The spear that went through his side. Our Savior, our Father, took our punishment for us. Lord, I pray that we always remember the cup. And I pray that we always remember what it represents. It represents your son's blood that poured out upon the streets, that poured down the cross, that poured down his head and down his body. Lord, I pray we never become numb to this event and that we always look to you uh, to it every Lord's day. We'll, we'll pause for a moment as we take part of the cup and the Lord, again, thank you for this opportunity that we can meet together, and we look forward to the day that we can partake of it again with our brothers and sisters physically together. Lord, please forgive us for we sin and fallen short, and we ask this in your son's name, and amen. shelter in the storm when everything went wrong a beckoning hand that led me back home a still small voice saying it's gonna be alright my song of hope in the darkest night
I'll be reading Luke 4, 1 through 13. Jesus, full of the Holy Spirit, left the Jordan and was led by the Spirit into the wilderness, where for 40 days he was tempted by the devil. He ate nothing during those days, and at the end of them he was hungry. The devil said to him, If you are the Son of God, tell the stone to become bread. Jesus answered, If it is written, Man shall not live on bread alone. The devil led him up to a high place and showed him in an instant all the kingdoms of the world. And he said to him, I will give you all their authority and splendor. It has been given to me, and I can give it to anyone I want to. If you worship me, it will be all yours. Jesus answered, It is, what it is written, Worship the Lord your God and serve him only. The devil led him to Jerusalem and had him stand on the highest point of the temple. If you are the Son of God, he said, throw yourself down from here, for it is written, He will command his angels concerning you to guard you carefully. They will lift you up in their hands so that you will not strike your foot or against a stone. Jesus answered, It is said, Do not put the Lord your God to the test. When the devil had finished all this tempting, he left him until an opportune time. So thankful for everybody who participated this morning and appreciate you all so very much. And we were thankful to have two of our young people from the church here today because uh, they're a real blessing to us. And Logan, who uh, opened uh, the service with uh, Psalm 100, uh, is a graduate of Johns Creek Middle School. And we do want to send out to all of our graduates uh, congratulations. We're just so sorry that you weren't able to have the normal celebration and recognition that you normally would deserve uh, at a graduation ceremony. Also, I want to thank Donovan, who is Logan's brother. Uh, Donovan is a, uh, will be a student at Pike Central High School as a junior uh, this fall, and want to thank him for his reading. His reading will be the basis of our scripture text uh, this morning about the temptation of Christ. And I want to ask a question about this. What does Christ's temptation show us? We know that it is meaningful not only for the experience that our Lord Jesus Christ had, but it's meaningful to each of us as we try to follow his example and live according to his precepts. We need to recognize, first of all, that temptation is not sin. Sometimes when bad thoughts come to our minds or we're tempted to lie or defend ourselves or get angry, we think, well, that's sin, but that's not the sin. It's yielding to the temptation that is the sin. The main idea in the Bible of temptation is a test. We know that temptations can come through Satan, but we also know that God sends tests to his people to make us stronger. There's three ways, or three things here, that we notice about this temptation. What did Christ's temptation show us? First of all, it showed us Satan's tactics. Secondly, his temptation showed us how to overcome the temptation. And thirdly, Christ's temptation shows his sympathy for us. As we look at this idea of Satan's tactics, we notice that he himself uses scripture, but he twists it. He also doesn't care about our condition. Christ, of course, was very hungry, having gone without food for 40 days. 
So Satan took advantage of his weakness. These are some of the tactics of Satan, and there are many others that he uses. But we know that Jesus used scripture also to counteract his false use of the scripture, misapplication of the scripture. So we need to remind ourselves that we first of all need to know the scripture to resist temptation, and secondly, we need to use it in the right way. Not just using proof texts to prove a point or an argument, but understanding the whole section of scripture so that we might be able to overcome sin in our lives. I mentioned to you that our Lord can sympathize with us because of his temptation. And this is brought out in Hebrews chapter 4, starting with verse number 14. Therefore, since we have a great high priest who has ascended into heaven, Jesus, the Son of God, let us hold firmly to the faith we profess. For we do not have a high priest who is unable to empathize with our weaknesses, but we have one who has been tempted in every way just as we are, yet he did not sin. Let us then approach God's throne of grace with confidence so that we may receive mercy and find grace to help us in our time of need. Maybe when we're tempted, we feel overwhelmed and even ashamed. But this verse of scripture here that I already read in verse 16 says, we should approach God's throne of grace, that means through prayer, with confidence so that we can receive mercy and find grace. So how did Jesus overcome his temptation? Three ways we read in this section of scripture that was shared with us by Donovan. First of all, prayer. At the end of Luke chapter 3 and verse 21, our Lord is being baptized. And we know that he did this to fulfill all righteousness. It wasn't like our baptism our baptism was to wash away sins. That's what it was said of Saul of Tarsus when Ananias, the preacher, came to him and told him to arise and be baptized and wash away thy sins. But Jesus did it to fulfill all righteousness. It says at that time that he was praying. And then it was soon after this that he was taken into the wilderness. So Jesus overcame temptation by prayer, but he also overcame with the Holy Spirit. At his baptism, the Holy Spirit descended on him as a dove. And the Bible says in chapter 4 and verse 1, Jesus was full of the Holy Spirit. Our Lord also, in overcoming temptation, used the word of God. If you pay, paid close attention to Donovan's text, in chapter 4 and verse 4, he read the words of Jesus, It is written. And then he quoted scripture. In verse 8 of that chapter, Jesus said, It is written. And he quoted scripture against Satan. In chapter 4 and verse 12, Jesus said, It is said, do not put the Lord your God to the test. So we too can over temptation in the same ways that our Lord did, through prayer, with the help of the Holy Spirit, and with the word of God. When we think about temptation as a trial or a test, we see that a test can be used two ways. Number one, it can be used as a weapon to defeat us. That's what Satan does. He uses temptation or tests to defeat us. However, 
God uses temptation or allows it as a tool to build us up. We see that the word test is used many times in the scripture for God's saints. In James chapter 1, in verses 2 through 4 in the New American Standard Version of the scriptures, it says, Consider it all joy, my brethren, when you encounter various trials, knowing that the testing of your faith produces endurance. And let endurance have its perfect result, so that you may be perfect and complete, lacking in nothing. That is God's purpose in letting tests come into our lives. We see that Luke's account is very similar or parallel to 1 John chapter 2 and verse 16. In 1 John 2, 16, in the King James Version of the Bible, it says, For all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh, and the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life, is not of the Father, but is of the world. You'll notice carefully that Jesus suffered temptation with each one of those. The lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life. You see, when our Lord was hungry, Satan said, you can make the stones into bread. So this was the lust of the flesh. Satan also told Jesus, I would give you all the kingdoms of the world, which is the lust of the eyes. And then... Satan told him to jump from the temple, and he quoted from Psalm 91, verses 11 and 12, Satan did, because it said that he would be protected. And that's when our Lord says we're not to tempt God. So the pride of life. We find out, however, that there's no shortcuts to the cross. And I think that was one of the greatest temptations that Satan was putting upon Jesus. If Jesus could have had all the kingdoms of the world, he could have forced everybody to be a Christian. But of course, that's not the way it works. We all have a choice in the matter. And God isn't going to make us do what we don't want to do. But there's no shortcuts to the cross. There's first suffering and then glory. That's what it says in Luke 24, 26. Did not the Messiah have to suffer the things, these things Jesus said, and then enter his glory? Jesus was trying to inform the disciples that terrible things would happen to him. But before there'd be glory, there had to be suffering. Satan can tempt us, interestingly enough, even in the holy city of Jerusalem. Our Lord Jesus Christ himself was without sin. He was near the holy place when he was tempted. So it doesn't matter where we're at. Satan is very bold and aggressive in approaching us. He's not afraid of us. He's not afraid to challenge us so that we can be tested, so that we can fail the test. Even as there's no shortcuts to the cross, there's no shortcuts to the Christian life. If Christ had to die, we should not expect an easy life ourselves. Again, let's look at the book of Luke, and this time the chapter number 9, starting with verse number 23. This is our Lord speaking. Whoever wants to be my disciple must deny themselves and take up their cross daily and follow me. For whoever wants to save their life will lose it, 
but whoever loses their life for me will save it. What good is it for someone to gain the whole world and yet lose or forfeit their very self? Whoever is ashamed of me and my words, the Son of Man will be ashamed of them when he comes in his glory and in the glory of the Father and of the holy angels. We see our Lord telling us here to take up our cross. This is a willful choice that we make in the Christian life. Sometimes that expression is used for people when they have to endure circumstances in their lives that are beyond their control. They may say, well, their illness is their cross that they have to bear. Or maybe the pressure of their job is the cross that they have to bear. Or the worry of their children is the cross that they have to bear. But I would submit to you that the cross Jesus is talking about is the one that we choose, not the one that comes upon us because of the difficulties of life. So are we going to choose Christ? As I close today, I want us to think about something that happened on the island of Cyprus during the first missionary journey of the Apostle Paul. There on the island of Cyprus, he met the proconsul, the man who was the head of the island. His name was Sergius Paulus. And the Bible says in Acts 13:8 that Sergius Paulus wanted to hear the word of God. That's what verse 8 says. But then we notice in verse 9, he had in his employment a sorcerer by the name of Elymas. And it says in verse 9, but Elymas the sorcerer tried to turn the proconsul from the faith. So we see here that a test came into his life. Was he going to listen to the teaching of the apostles, the missionaries? Or was he going to pay attention to this sorcerer that he himself had hired? But in verse 12, we see that Sergius Paulus won out. It says, The proconsul believed, for he was amazed about the teaching about the Lord. Now, if you read the whole text there, you would notice that the apostles were angry at Elymas and they blinded him for a season. And you would think that this is what would have really impressed Sergius Paulus. But instead of saying he was impressed with the miracle, the Bible says he was amazed about the teaching about the Lord. I hope you and I are amazed about the Lord's teaching and we never get comfortable with it, we, we never get commonplace with it, that we'll always be challenged by it every day and every way. One of the things that impresses me about the early conversions in the book of Acts is that for the most part, and I would say always, that no one pressured the people to be baptized when they believed. On the day of Pentecost, the first sermon was preached by Peter, and we see that in the crowd, they yelled out, Men and brethren, what must we do? They interrupted the preacher. He didn't have an invitation to him. And then we see when Philip was teaching the Ethiopian eunuch as he sat in his chariot reading from Isaiah the prophet, chapter 53, it says at that point Jesus began to teach him about Jesus. And then we hear the Ethiopian saying, See, here is water. What doth hinder me to be baptized? So as we look at these examples, it should always be a desire of our own heart to obey the Lord, to believe, to repent, to confess as the Ethiopian did, 
to be baptized, to be faithful unto God, to use our gifts and our talents and our abilities and our whole life in service to him. It's our choice, and I pray that we'll make the right one. We're thankful that you were in our hearing today in this broadcast, and we're looking forward to the time, as Mike said in the beginning of the service, and Jason said also in his prayer. We're looking forward when we gather together as a congregation. We'll have more details about that in our next program because we're going to open up for services on June the 7th. Things will be a little different, but we're going to draw, abide by the CDC regulations and have social distancing and do all the things that they tell us to do to prepare. We may be even having dual services. If so, uh, you will be informed about that through our one call uh, system that we have here at the church. So we're looking forward to not only our members coming back, but also visitors in our community who may have watched us for the last several weeks. And we pray that you will join us as well. Let's go to God in prayer. Our gracious Heavenly Father, it's a great privilege to come before your presence, to be able to share your word, to be able to pray for those in need. We know, dear God, that there are many who are suffering greatly as a result of this pandemic. First of all, directly as people who've contracted the disease, some who've lost their loved ones from the disease and are grieving, others who are taking care of them are also having been exposed, some of them even passed. So I pray for them especially as they're out front there taking care of things for the rest of us. We pray for those who've lost their jobs. We pray that they'll soon get back to work. Pray for those whose businesses have gone down. I pray that they can somehow get them back. And I pray, dear God, that you'll bless each one of us, that when we do return uh, to our services, that we will be more determined to be able to do your will, to help others, to be the kind of Christians we should be, and to give you the honor and glory that you deserve. We ask all this in Jesus' name. Amen.